Good afternoon, and welcome to today's electronic design webcast. Our topic today is simplifying machine controller integration, a case study of a feeder system with EtherCAT vision and IoT functionality, sponsored by Kingstar, an Interval Zero company. I'm James Moore with, with Endeavor's Design Engineering Group. To start, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First off, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, simply hit F5 to refresh your webcast console. If you need assistance solving common issues, please click on the yellow help icon below the slides. This webinar technology allows you to resize the presentation by clicking the maximize icon or by dragging the lower right corner to enlarge the window. You're also welcome to ask questions during today's event. We'll answer as many as possible during the Q&A session following the main presentation, but please feel free to send in your questions at any time. To do so, simply type your questions into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the submit button. Also, please be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on Electronic Design's website within the next week. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. Now let's meet today's speaker. Jerry Lights has over 25 years of experience developing high performance motion control and vision systems, as well as developing real-time software to control automation equipment. You can learn more about our speaker by clicking on the blue speaker bio widget on your console toolbar. Now let me turn things over to our presenter. Jerry, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I'm Jerry Lights of Kingstar, and I'm going to talk about simplifying machine controller integration. So for the goal here, we're going to show you how to produce automation equipment just using standard industrial PCs. And this will support trends within IoT and the Industry 4.0. And importantly, no other hardware is needed besides server drives and I.O. modules. Now the biggest challenge of all this is that Industry 4.0 demands PC solutions that are truly open. And the benefits of this are in machine scalability. You can just keep adding more servo drives. And quality, centralized software with distributed hardware is much better for things like electronic gearing because now you've got access to every single drive's positions. And the work cell scalability, integrating controllers like Vision lets you add just what you need. And for quality, if you can exchange data with higher level systems, it can really offer actionable insights, not just more data. Uh, now for a quick agenda, we'll start with key elements of an industrial PC-based open platform. We'll add the PC details, and we'll try to be as specific as we can. We'll add a real-time OS, and then an EtherCAT-enabled mo motion software platform. Then we'll talk about adding a second controller, specifically for machine vision, and then a case study of this in action with Pitney Bowes, where I was uh, fortunate enough to work there for about 15 years. Um, and then we'll address some other trends like machine consolidation for scalability, IoT integration to support Industry 4.0. So into some real nitty gritty here, the basic facts are that PCs are fast. You don't need FPGAs and DSPs anymore because PCs with a standard multi-core CPU, uh, they're, they're as fast as, as you can imagine now. And we've done tests where floating point numbers, which used to, used to always use integers for everything, now you can have two floating point numbers multiplied or divided in like four nanoseconds and three nanoseconds for integers. And frankly, that means that floating point wins. There's so many advantages to it that the extra nanosecond, it, it's trivial. Uh, if you look at doing a servo calculation, it might take 10 multiplications for, to produce the new position. Um, and even if you're doing electronic gearing, maybe 15 more or so, 25 calculations at four nanoseconds is only 100 nanoseconds per servo. So 20 servos might need two microseconds per tick of actual computation time. It really lets you work on path planning and PID loops and anything you need to do, you can do that right in the CPU. And once you make that decision to use doubles, you can take an encoder value, which of course comes in as an integer, but you don't have to keep it that way anymore. You can immediately store it as a double and then multiply it by a counts per meter or counts per unit number, and 
now you've got real world units. So two servo drives that are dr driving two linear axes can be geared together with totally different encoders and motors and everything else about it because you're gearing their distances. You're gearing this, this position, which is represented as a double. Now, although a double can store a very large value, you still have to worry about the actual precision. And we can, I'm going to explain that right here. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you look at an 8-byte double, it really has 52 bits of precision, 11 bits of an exponent, and 1 bit for the sign. Those 11 bits for the exponent are great. They can make a gigantic number, but they don't do you any good for working with an encoder value. So you're really limited to the 52 bits. You're going to bring in your, your uh, encoder, which is an integer. You're going to turn it into a double. But when you need to send the command position and go back the other way, you still only have 52 bits to get the whole job done. So this was back in about the year 2000. We said, well, what if I had a 10,000 count per rev per motor running at 8,000 RPM, and I was on a centrifuge moving a test tube? How long can I run before I blow through those 52 bits? We didn't know if it was a week or a month or a year. So we went through this calculation. It turns out to be 107 years. So basically, 52 bits is plenty, as it turns out. Now, you can argue that there are uh, common motors these days, like Yaskawa has 20-bit encoders, and that would drop that to a year. But still, it, even though it's something you have to consider, in almost all applications, you don't have to even worry about that anymore. So now let's talk about a specific PC. What we really like, and we've tested these, is uh, the, the Intel CPU, the i3-8100. That's the eighth generation uh, CPU. It's got four cores, and it's only $120. The socket, now the, these details, the FCE LGA-1151 and the 300 series chipset, all that really means is find one of the hundreds of motherboards that are out there that have that 1151 with the 300 series. They're everywhere. And <clears throat> that's what tells you that the i3 will work in there. And many other CPU chips will work in there for when you need to have increased horsepower and you need to go up. For RAM, Windows 10 is going to cost you over 3 gigabytes on its own. You're just better off. Put 8 gigabytes in it. It's not going to cost you much. It'll handle any application you're going to come across. And then you need a NIC card to talk to your hardware, the Intel i210. It's easy to get. It's very deterministic. Total cost of this box in a metal enclosure with a solid-state hard drive, maybe 900 bucks. There's lots of different vendors, uh, different temperature ranges. And the key to it is the next step up, when you need more horsepower, you just pull that i3 out, literally by opening the spring lever on the, on the socket and pulling out the i3 and dropping in like a i5-8500, six cores for 200 bucks, or an i7-8700, which has six cores and essentially 12 threads because it uses hyper-threading. Many Windows programs seem to benefit from having the larger number of threads. Personally, down in, in real time, we need one core, which, which is more than enough for us. And so even with that, you're up to, say, $325. So now what we've got is a, a PC that's really fast, but it doesn't have any determinism. Windows works with a multimedia timer down in the one or two millisecond range, but every now and then you're going to take a 20 millisecond time hit, and that's a disaster. Enter the RTOS. So now what we're looking at is RTX 64 is a real-time operating system. It enhances Windows. It works cooperatively with it, but it, it just uh, makes it able to handle real time. And it does this by we go in during the installation process and we, we replace the hardware abstraction layer. So any interrupts that come in, whether it's a timer or other hardware, we get them first. If it's for Windows, we pass it to Windows, and they, they don't even know we're there. Uh, and, in fact, if you looked in the uh, task manager of Windows, and you said, well, how are my CPUs doing? It would only show three, because we're going to take one core always to handle the real-time uh, software. So, so we do hide some resources from it. We also have our own scheduler. We have our own priorities. And when programs are created, they end up with an extension of .rtss. They're loaded in memory differently. They run differently. They have lots of different code that's different. 
We'll show you how to create them later, but they're, they're RTSSs, they're not EXEs, and probably the most common application is for somebody to just go in and say, hey, give me a 500 microsecond repeating timer. I want to, have, I want to do something uh, very deterministically and every 500 microseconds. So that's a typical, or maybe one millisecond, something along those lines. Now, now you, can, you can imagine we're building a Windows side and an RTX side. Um, when they need to talk to each other, and let's face it, they always do, you just allocate a chunk of shared memory. And you can define that shared memory as a type of a data structure. So you define it in, with an include file. And you just say, I've got these bools and these ints and these doubles. And, and by the way, I want to have a diagnostic array that's uh, two gigabytes if you wanted to. You could make it. You could store data from servos and, and load that up and get that up to the Windows side. So you just use shared memory for that. So now what we've really got is a highly deterministic machine that's fast. Now we need to be able to talk to the hardware. And that's where EtherCAT comes in. So EtherCAT is, as we think, it's the field bus that won the field bus wars. It goes out over 100 megabit, you know, Ethernet cable, but it's a very deterministic packet. It's the same size. It goes out. It talks to each and every servo drive. They're all out in the chain. And you, all you need is one cable to go from the NIC that we were already talking about, the I-210, and it goes out to the different servo drives. And so... Kingstar is a soft motion library that has all the normal functionality. You can talk to it and say, I want, I want you to move this motor here. I'm asking about the status of this motor. I need this motor to do something else. Off you go. You send commands like any other motion library. It does the trajectory generation and anything else you might need. One of the other things that it does that's specific for EtherCAT, though, I, I have to say, most EtherCAT masters what they do is they require you to have an ESI file, which is an EtherCAT slave information file, and it defines how the servo drive works. Um, and you have to have that on the machine at runtime. Not only that, and you have to have it for each of the servos or, and I.O. in the network, but not only that, you have to use a configuration tool to create an ENI file, which is a EtherCAT network information file, and that gets really ugly because every time you make a change, you have to go back and redo that configuration. What we do is we just we take we well we've gone out to every manufacturer of the hundreds and we've gotten their latest ESI files and we've incorporated them into a, a known database, which we keep in a custom format. We don't need the ESI file to be on the machine at all. So when you power up the EtherCAT, we simply discover what's out there. We ask all the drives, what are you, what are you, what are you? And it comes back and it says, well, I'm, here's my vendor code, my product code, and my revision. Perfect. We look in our database. We know you. Good. We don't care where you are in the, in the network. And if you power up the next time and you move a drive around, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to handle you. It's, it's absolutely no problem. And EtherCAT lets us do all that. It couldn't be any easier. So now here is a typical architecture. This is a real PC. This is essentially using that i3-8100. Everything in blue is Windows, and everything in red is real-time. So you can see there's three cores for the Windows side, and there's one core for the real-time side. So at the top, you might have a, a UI under Windows and some sort of Windows application, it's the business logic, it knows what type of machine you're controlling, and it sends commands down to shared memory. The RTX 64 is a real-time application that probably runs every 500 microseconds or every millisecond, and it sits there and looks at the shared memory, it sees commands, and it has a series of state machines that goes in and runs the hardware that it needs to do. It then talks to Kingstar Motion and sends motion commands, and it, it talks to the EtherCAT NIC, and here you go. There, send, there's your uh, simple diagram. This was for a real customer. This was very much like a lathe. You had a rotation axis and a linear. <clears throat> so now the question is, how do you create these programs? And the answer is, you use Visual Studio. It's got a lot of advantages. With Visual Studio, you can go in and create a solution. And the solution says, I want to have a new Windows project. So off to the left, you can see Win Automation, and that's an 
that's a Windows project, uh, perhaps written in C Sharp, C++, however it is. And now we want to create a real-time program. So as you look in red, we go File, New Project, Visual C++, and we pick RTX 64 application because we're perfectly integrated with Visual Studio. We have the templates already in place when you do the installation, and you're off and running. And now the first thing it's going to do when you hit the Enter button on this, it's going to say, what do you really need? And the first thing you're likely to say is, I need a repeating timer. So what it will do is it will create a CPP file and an include file, and it will put a main in, and it will put in just enough code to be a real-time program with a timer in it. And so you can build that, and you're off and running. And one of the best things about this is it puts it in the same solution as the Windows side. So now when you want to, for instance, define that shared memory region as a structure, that's one include file. Both projects have access to that one and only file so that you're not making changes in two places. And so you're off and running and you're, you're making, making programs. So now we're going to show a, an application that's just a little more advanced. And we're going to call this uh, like a medium performance vision. So in this case, what we've done, and this is for, say, fiducial alignment. It's great for printed circuit boards, but we have a lot of people that cut vinyl on CNC machines, and they want to just put a mark on there on the pattern so that they can lay their material down on a vacuum plate and not have to accurately fixture it. So in this case, you've got, in addition to everything that you had before, now you have a vision app that knows what you're looking for, what type of camera, and it sends commands to RT Vision. RT Vision is actually OpenCV ported to run in the real-time space. And it talks to the Giggy NIC, which is already in the PC we already talked about. It's an Intel i211, and, and it's already there. And by the way, there's still wireless in that PC to talk to the higher level computers. And so this tells the, the camera now, take a, acquire an image of this. Now the only thing with this is, to be specific, if the RTX application took, let's say 150 microseconds every tick, and Kingstar Motion took 150, that's 300 uh, microseconds out of, let's say, 500. So there's only 200 microseconds left the vision is going to have to run at a lower priority because the other two cannot afford to miss and consider themselves uh, deterministic real time. So that one's only going to run at 40, at say 40% duty cycle, which means that a, a job that was supposed to take you 50 milliseconds is going to take you two and a half times as long. So there it's going to cost you 125 milliseconds. But at the end of the day, if it's a fiducial mark, I took a picture of it and my server was moving to the next fiducial mark. So that time overlapped. So in that case, it was okay, it didn't hurt anybody. Here's the next, another case where you're looking at, say, barcodes on a piece of material that's coming by every 150 milliseconds. Now things are a little bit different. It, you don't really, you're not sure you're gonna have enough time. So what do you do? You pull out the i3-8100 and you drop in an i5-8500. Now you've got six cores. Windows picks up an extra core, no problem with that. And now the real time has an extra core. And there's core four working on RTX 64 and Kingstar. And now core five is doing the entire vision application. So however long it takes to process that barcode, hey, you're doing fine. Um, you're, you're good to go. Now for a quick case study for Pitney Bowes. I worked for these guys for about 15 years. It was pure software-based motion control. Uh, we started in about the year 2000. They were using a different operating system, which I won't name. We switched to RTX, and it was the best thing uh, we've ever done, they've ever done, <clears throat> and they're still using it today. So I have to, re th these machines, by the way, they build your credit card bill, that machine up in the top in blue. That, it, it, American Express probably owns 10 of those, and they will do mi billings and, and other large, credit card companies do the same thing. That roll of paper probably has 80,000 customers bills on it. And it chops it up with a cutter and it scans it and it folds it and drops advertisements on it, stuffs it in an envelope, and it's all running RTX 64. Uh, 
they actually made their own EtherCAT before it existed. They made their own boards, but it, it's the same thing. It goes out 100 megabits, and it shoots packets out, and it runs servos. It's the same thing as EtherCAT. It's before EtherCAT was really readily available at a reasonable price. So I have to read this quote from my old boss. RTX allowed us to combine our Windows and real-time development groups into one development team using Microsoft Visual Studio. RTX also allowed us to cut our PC hardware costs in half, and that is true. The first day we worked on that machine, it had three PCs in it for the real-time and one PC for the Windows side of the higher-level software. We realized pretty quickly we could condense that into two. Then it went down into one plus the higher level one. As of today, they use an i5 level CPU with four cores and it is one PC running that entire machine, both the Windows side and the RTX side. And this is just to show you there's some other machines there that they're, they look familiar, but they're, they're different. Some of them are more flexible, but slower and that sort of thing. So major trend is collapsing controllers. Typically, controllers have always worked on their own CPU, which is very difficult for integration. But with an open, PC-based platform, you just take the EtherCAT cable of the new accessory and plug it into the end of your machine. Add the new piece of software to run it. Put it on the same PC, and they share the EtherCAT like it's a common resource. Just tell it where its servos begin. If there's any handshaking needed, you can just set up, set or test some I.O. bits in shared memory that's really already set up for this. So now here's your first phase. This is what we call phase one of, of, of IoT. Uh, and what we're doing here, we're going to introduce the first phase by saying um, use some tools that you already have. And the first one we're going to use is IIS, Internet Information Services. It's, on, it's software that's on every Windows PC. And here it's shown with a UI that's actually serving that as a web page. Now, any phone or tablet can access that screen, and it's also large enough to be seen from almost anywhere on the factory floor. That was a 28-inch monitor, and you can get the local status, like how big is the job, how is it doing, and really importantly, when's it, when is it going to finish? Now, other data can be self-analyzed, like RMS motor currents. Decisions can be made at the time for that, and it could show up on that screen or any other information that you're, that you're tempted to put up there. So here's a concrete example of just starting to fall behind. This, this overall system's having problems, but you can see under the red bar by efficiency, it's the operator is falling behind. The machine's doing fine. And a manager anywhere on the floor can see this. And again, with a phone or tablet, he can hit that from anywhere. And this operator really needs to load material faster, maybe get some finished mail off the machine. So now as we move into Phase two, really, we're going to move the data a little higher. So we're going to move the data up to the cloud. We can get all machines to move the data higher, and now you have one server that gives you status of the whole floor in one view. And again, this is accessible from a phone or tablet from anywhere. So here, seven machines are in various stages of running, and you can, you can select one, as we've done with that second one, and see how's it really doing. So with OPC UA, PCs can get their data anywhere. And the key here is actionable insights. Things like sending a text to a field tech, tell the machine three help needs help and now, or a scanner is misreading, so go fix that. Clear off the paper dust, refocus it. Whatever it needs, it needs it now. Or the biggest of them all, back in the, in the Pitney Bowes days, um, a very fast machine that just finished the job shouldn't start another. Let it wait even 45 minutes because there's a very large job coming in that would really benefit from using a faster machine. Uh, and that was, that was really the, the holy grail from their point of view. So here's a summary of the architecture for, for these types of machines. You can see in red you've got Interval Zero RTX and, uh, and you've got Kingstar Motion. You've got Machine Control IP. That's your own custom programs. You've got Vision sitting there. You've also got Kingstar PLC and, the, and running EtherCAT. We also offer a stand, you know, a soft PLC. So for people who are used to programming in PLCs, you can just use this PLC 
program it as a structured text, ladder diagrams, function blocks, the whole bit. And then over on the Windows side, you've still got your own HMI. You can write things in C Sharp. You can write things in C++. There's a whole host of different things that you can do. Um, so there you go. Are there any questions? All right, a few of you have already submitted questions, so we're going to jump right in. If you'd like to submit a question now, type your question into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the Submit button. While we're answering your questions, please complete the feedback form, which is located on the bottom of your screen. All right, so the first question here asks, uh, you mentioned EtherCAT as a field bus, but there are other real-time field bus standards like Profinet and Circos. Uh, why do you consider EtherCAT the best? Well, with uh, Profinet and Circos, I mean, they're outstanding standards. No, no debate. They deliver real-time automation. Um, but ServoDrive and I.O. manufacturers, they've embraced EtherCAT to the point where there are hundreds, if not thousands, of, uh, of servo drives that are available that support EtherCAT, and that's just not so for those other standards. They do offer a reasonably wide range, but it will only, you know, it, it's only going to run their own equipment for the most part. So you end up getting locked into a vendor. I think probably the most compelling reason, though, is just that EtherCAT has so many, so many vendors that already support it. All right, so the next question we have here asks, with EtherCAT auto configuration, can I mix and match servo drives, servo drive brands? For example, use a low-cost servo drive brand for a low-performance operation like a tool changer, but use a high-performance brand for the operations with more precise requirements like CNC or surface mount technology? Yes, and, and that's really one of the benefits of EtherCAT, really, is that there's you know, with the last question of how many vendors already support it, there's such a wide range of them available. You can have low power stepper drives that are reasonably inexpensive and, and up to very, very high horsepower spindle drives for CNC machine tools. And they're all available. They all have their own ESI file. We've taken all of these popular uh, ESI files and pulled them in and they're already in, in our database. So yeah, you can mix and match and, and on one machine, you can have any combination of any other drives. Not only that, but if you take the network down and then you add something, and this is really one of the most popular things to do is when you add a controller, you just plug it in at the end and now I've got three new servo drives. You power up and we discover that, oh, there's three new servo drives out there. All we have to do is load the software for those three, and you're good to go. So, yeah, you can mix and match I.O. with analog I.O. You can mix and match servos and steppers, high performance, low performance from 100 different vendors. Yes. Okay, so the next question asks, the EtherCAT auto discover and auto configure sound like a real benefit. How do other vendors address configuration? Well, as, as we, we talked a little bit about it before, they force you to use a configuration tool. They force you to have the, the ESI file, the EtherCAT slave information file. It has to be on the machine while you do your configuration. And then when you run the software, they read the ENI file made by the configuration tool, but they still expect the ESI file to be there. So it's really... There's a, there's a lot of overhead in doing that. And the one, one of the big things about that is you're just not likely to change a drive because it's so difficult, so cumbersome sometimes to have to go back through that configuration. Some people have just said, oh, I'm going to leave the network the way it is. Uh, other people who are looking to be a little more cost conscious have said, hey, I just got my prototype up. I've got 20 servos in it. I can actually replace these four drives with less powerful units or, or a different brand and, and just go ahead and do that. And, you, and in this case, it's so easy to do it. You literally unplug it and plug the new one in. 
and you're up and running. So it's quite easy. Okay, it looks like we have time for a few more questions. The next one is a two-parter, and it starts returning to your mail sorting example. Can you give a concrete example of a module that you would add into the system and explain all the programming required to change the system to accommodate it? Uh, can it really be parameterized and just run on a single PC? Yeah, so one of the things we had is, as, the, as the mail on that mailing machine reached the end, we had a vendor that used to make some equipment for us, and they said, we want to make something that actually removes the finished mail pieces, sweeps them into a postal tray, and pushes them out on a conveyor and heads them towards the shipping department so they get picked up by, by, the, by the post office. And they came in and said, hey, we want to, we want, we'll use your boards. They'll, they'll use those dual-access boards that were with our sort of custom EtherCAT. And at the end of the day, they came in and they had a PC in the machine, and we, we, we're talking to them like, you don't need that PC. Just give us that cable. And we took the cable out and plugged it into the end of the last existing uh, board that was already in the system, and it just looked like four more new servo drives. And then we told them, run your software on our machine. Load it up over there. And all they had to do was type in a couple of parameters. I, I start at servo 52, and my IO starts at IO module 49, and off you go. And next thing you know, their software was running on the same PC as the others, and, and that was it. You were off and running. They, they did not need to use another PC. All right, great. And this is the last question I think we have time for, and it is, with the EtherCAT auto configuration, what happens if one servo drive can only handle 500 microsecond cycles and another servo can handle 250 microseconds? Can they work together? That's a good question. Yes. Yes, you can. If you had that situation, uh, you would run your EtherCAT at a basic speed of 250 microseconds per tick. But already in the ESI file for that drive that runs at 500 microseconds, our software sees that he can only run at 500 microseconds. So what Kingstar is going to do is only talk to that drive on every other tick. So the drive still feels that it's being accessed at a 500 microsecond tick, while other drives that are, that are faster can run at their 250 microsecond tick. We actually have a customer who has a very good PC. I don't know if it's an i3-8100, but it's probably not. But uh, what they did, they run their I.O. modules at 50 microseconds, and they run their servo modules at 250 microseconds. So they actually get really good performance out of this. Their I.O. is very, very fast literally 50 microseconds, they can sample that. And then when it's time to move the drive somewhere, they just tell those drives to move at the 250 microsecond level. And if they wanted to have a slower one, you could have one that's running it at a millisecond and it would it all comes out in the wash. You just, you just tell us how fast to run the drive. All right, well, I'm afraid we've run out of time. So that concludes today's presentation. On behalf of Electronic Design, I'd like to thank Kingstar for sponsoring today's event, and of course, all of you for joining. Have a great rest of the day.